All right, good morning. Today is Easter Sunday. It's very early in the morning, and I decided to do Lecture 9B this morning <clears throat> because of being able to upload this maybe a bit quicker than I did 9A. So let's get started. I am on page 153 of my PowerPoint, which co should coincide with your PowerPoint as well. We're continuing with chapter nine, which covers speech and language disorders in the home, in the school, and in the community. And I do believe that we finished up with dyslexia in 9A, and we're going to continue and move forward with learning disabilities and talk about that. Some of you may have a learning disability and may have had an IEP in school and you went to the resource room and uh, spent time with the resource teacher. You may have even had some private tutors that your parents hired to help you out. And we know, as we talked about dyslexia, that we don't really identify many times dyslexia until the third grade or a little bit later in adolescence, which is a reading learning disability. But we do know that a lot of children in the public school, private schools, do have difficulty learning to read. And that would be considered a learning disability. We know that the incidence is 43.8% of school-aged children that would comprise learning disabled, being learning disabled, or in the category of learning disabilities. We also know that it is a lifelong deficit. However, the good part of this is that you can learn to compensate for this disability and learn strategies, compensatory strategies that you can use to help you out. And adults do it all the time. If I go to the grocery store, I make a list because I cannot remember everything that I need. And if I don't make a list, every time I will forget something. You may need to have a calendar in which you write down appointments important things that are coming up, uh, dates to remember. And you may look at that at the beginning of each week and know what's coming. And those are the kinds of strategies that we try and teach. And as a speech pathologist, uh, we, in a therapy situation, we would teach compensatory strategies. You as the classroom teacher would also try and teach some compensatory strategies, as would the resource teacher. There's a wide variation of learning disabilities and areas that a child may have problems with. Unfortunately, not every child in public school will qualify for services because the school system will have a set of criteria that they must follow in order to right in IEP. Unfortunately, these children who don't qualify are going to fall through the cracks, may continue to have problems, grades may fall, um, and they could become chronic failures due to some additional external problems such as it causes great anxiety because they're not doing as well as their peers. So um, we know that those are the kiddos who fall through the cracks. And again, parents may need to become involved and provide additional help outside of the school system. Many times we don't know what causes a speech problem because there are so many factors that play into it. There are times when it's not as important to me as a diagnostician to know the cause, the why. 
because I still have a set of characteristics, a set of deficits that I need to work on. That's more important to me, identifying the deficits, writing behavioral objectives, and then working towards achieving those goals in a therapy setting. These learning disabilities can be lifelong in terms of in um, dealing with how you function in society. Um, we know that we have a predisposition and parents many times will say, oh, I had the same problem. So we have parents who don't want their children to experience what they experienced, therefore they understand and will provide help pretty quickly. In terms of a speech disorder or articulation disorder, Van Riper and Erickson did some research and published that research in 1996. And this is what they said, quote, speech is impaired when it deviates so far from the speech of other people that it's conspicuous, it's unintelligible, or it's unpleasant to both the speaker and the listener. Well, what that says to me is that I need to be a good listener. I need to listen to parents and the fears that they express and what they see happening with that child at home. And I need to listen to the child and how the child explains their particular problems with learning. They don't understand it. We don't understand the cause, but maybe we can together and make it a bit better for them. As we think about the speaker, if you have a child who has a pretty significant articulation disorder, make sure that you're talking to the speech pathologist. But keep in mind that the speech, the way that the student produces sounds, produces speech, is just one small part of what we're talking about with communication. But language competence is necessary for effective communication as we know it to make them more successful. Oral speech and achieving good language skills are foundation to the development of literacy. Now remember, one area of language feeds over to another area. So if you're having trouble in reading, you may also have trouble in spelling. But this, the flip side of that is if you improve reading, hopefully we're seeing improvement in spelling. They work in tandem in terms of deficits, but they also work in tandem in terms of improvement. One area improves another area many times. Not all Communication, meaning speech and language disorders, can be remediated or not easily. We hope to make some improvement, but um, we need a student who's motivated to make changes and has trust in you as the educator. As we look at potential causes, we look at functional disorders, we look at organic disorders, and we look at acquired organic disorders. Now, a functional disorder is described as or explained as, I've done testing, I've done everything I know to do, the test results are here, but I still can't explain the why behind it. We're, we're not able to um, explain it. And, and identify it as such. Examples of functional influences would be reduced environmental stimulation, poor motivation. If you're a chronic failure in the classroom, you're not real motivated. Why should I try? I try and I still fail. So we're, we're looking at poor motivation and that is very difficult to deal with. Emotional issues along with being a failure in the classroom comes anxiety. 
and more emotional issues that will suppress learning. Disorders that have no organic base. We can't explain it. Include phonological disorders and a specific language impairment. We know what we have, but we don't know the why. An organic disorder, on the other hand, is one that is caused by an identifiable pathology of an organ system. We can identify a hearing loss and deafness. We know why. If there's a genetic syndrome that compromises the intellectual development, such as in Down syndrome, we have growths on the vocal folds that cause a child's voice to be raspy. There could be some paralysis of, a voc of the vocal folds, maybe just one unilateral paralysis. Well, as we learned earlier, that goes back to cranial nerve damage. So we know the why. We can identify it. As we talk about acquired organic conditions, that could be traumatic brain injury. We also call it TBI. It may be a degenerative neurological disease, such as a brain tumor. It could be in older adults, ALS, which is a neurological disease that is very progressive, that results in the individual's inability to produce speech. We have multiple sclerosis. We have juvenile Huntington's disease. Any condition that is neurologically based. So we know the why. We can identify that. Also, when we talk about prenatal environments and how this little infant, this fetus is developing uh, within the mother's womb, we know for a fact that prenatal care is vital. Prenatal vitamins, we know the mother needs to have proper nutrition. We know proper rest and some exercise. We know that the person needs to quit smoking if they do, avoid drugs, avoid alcohol, because those are teratogens. Those are negative chemicals that can cause damage to the fetus and result in premature birth. Premature birth is considered a, a fetus that is born before 37 weeks gestation. So normal gestation is 40 weeks and a low birth weight that is below five and a half pounds. When you think about the average weight of a, a newborn, seven pounds, 10 ounces, seven pound, 13 ounces, it could be in the six pound range, could be in the eight pound range. But the average six, seven pounds is what we think of as an average weight for a newborn. But if you have a newborn that was full term, approximately 40 weeks, and that baby only weighs four pounds, that's a red flag. A full term baby should weigh more than four pounds. So that tells me within the mother's pregnancy, something wasn't going quite right. And some of these teratogens, these chemicals, uh, the smoking, the drugs, the alcohol, do many times result in a premature birth. And therefore, we're going to have learning disabilities and communication problems. Now, I'm gonna give you a, a scenario here. Um, <clears throat> this is something that I did take from a case history. This baby was born at 27 weeks gestation. Remember, normal gestation is 40 weeks, and this baby only weighed a pound and six ounces. The baby went to the NICU, the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, for three months and was tube fed. They had a nasogastric tube that went through the nose, NG tube, went down to the stomach, and they were fed uh, with liquids, like insure type stuff. They crawled at one year. They walked unaided at two and a half years. 
go back to our milestones. And we know that a, a toddler begins walking at about one year old. And this child walked unaided at two and a half. That's a significant delay. First word was at two years compared to normal development. First words at a year and they use sentences at three years. So we're looking at two years, that little, that little guy's beginning to put words together. This child did not until a year later. The central nervous system evaluation that was conducted resulted in these conditions. An adjustment disorder with anxiety, neurodevelopmental disorder, emotional problems, ADHD, speech and language disorders, memory loss, possible sensory disorder, borderline intellectual functioning, executive functioning, remember that's the frontal lobe, sleep disorder and seizures. That's, these were the characteristics that the parents shared with us. The family also reported vision problems, Poor eater, these kids are picky, picky, picky eaters. Sometimes they don't know what to do with the food that they have in their mouths. They're stubborn. They're more interested in things. They don't want that social contact with another person. They're interested in those things and seem to isolate themselves. Frequent nightmares, they're shy, they're nail biters. They give up easily and they have a lot of trouble sleeping. When I have a case history come in and the baby was born at 27 weeks gestation in a pound and a half, I'm going to ask that parent, tell me what kind of a sleeper they are and what kind of an eater they are. Because you've got to be well nourished, well hydrated and have enough sleep in order to have early intervention services, be able to be at your best to learn. So that was an example of a child that did come into the clinic and that was part of their case history. We also have uh, what we call APGAR scores. And I did mention that in class once. APGAR, A-P-G-A-R. The A stands at, at birth, at one minute and five minutes, the infant is evaluated. In each of the five areas, the child is given a number ranking of zero to two at one minute and five minutes. So that tells me that if the child was perfect, they would have had the score of a two in each of the five areas for a total points of 10. Okay? So at, with the A, we're looking at the appearance or the color. The P, we're looking at pulse or heart rate. The G is grimace or reflexes. How is the baby reacting to the, the environment that they're in? They're not used to being outside of the womb, so the stimuli is coming at them. The A, we're looking at activity and muscle tone. And R, we're looking at respiration and the child's or the infant's ability to breathe. How easy is it for them to breathe? So as I said, they're evaluated at one minute and they, there is a score. They're re-evaluated at five minutes to see if there has been an improvement in those APGAR scores. And that gives us a ranking. A score of zero to three means that infant needs immediate resuscitation. That baby may be non-responsive. A score of four to six means the infant needs some assistance breathing, and a score of between seven and 10 means that they're within a normal range. The seven, uh, they're probably going to monitor. Uh, not too many tens out there, but um, certainly eights and nines are what you want to see. The newborn is also given eye ointment to prevent gonorrhea from infecting the eyes. We do have sexually transmitted diseases that can result in negative outcomes for that baby. They also receive a vitamin K shot, so their blood will clot because their vitamin K is low. 
They will go through a newborn hearing screening. They will also have a heart scan to measure the oxygen level. And they're going to have a heel stick, which is a blood test that will be conducted too. Lots of things are happening in that delivery room. Now, in, the in all 50 states, we have what we call the newborn screening for genetic and metabolic disorders. All 50 states do this, and it's taken through a blood test, that heel stick. There is no law that says each state has to do this, um, which is why there's a variety of tests that are given. Oh, you're going to hear <laughs> uh, Addie barking because the uh, water softener came on and the water softener is in a closet off of my kitchen and I'm in the kitchen. So I hope that doesn't interfere too much. It is three o'clock in the morning. So, and that it's, it's scheduled and set to um, do whatever it does in the early morning hours. I'm sorry, let's go back to what I was talking about. Okay, the newborn screening for genetic and metabolic disorders. Now, um, each state does this, but each state is different in the number of, of tests that they run. There is no law that says they have to do 10 or 20. But Indiana, I do believe, will test for 20 or more genetic or metabolic disorders. And that's a really good thing because in many of these genetic and metabolic disorders, symptoms don't begin until days or even weeks after birth. Well, when symptoms are showing up, there could al already be damage to the nervous system, to the kidneys, to vision, hearing, and other body systems. So you wanna do that testing right away. You don't wanna wait until a system shows up this testing came about in about the 1960s and um, due to a test for what we call PKU, which is a metabolic disorder. Now, I don't want to get into this much because this isn't a class for that, but I would hear about PKU babies. And if the, if the PKU is not picked up, the results can be devastating. So I want you to Google PKU and you'll learn a little bit more about it. Um, within the first few days of life, between 24 hours and seven days after birth, they, they, these infants will be tested. And some of the other things that they're looking for would be, I said the PKU, congen congenital hypothyroidism, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, and uh, this one is interesting to me, maple syrup urine, urine disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, they call it that because the urine output has a sweet smell. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. But they will do this testing early. But you know, part of, part of sometimes what happens too is that um, if the mother comes in and deliver, to deliver a baby and mother doesn't have insurance and mother's gonna deliver that baby and may 20, 24 hours later be gone out of the hospital. Or if the mother is a drug user and she knows there's potentially going to be a problem because they've taken blood from her, um, she's going to run. So these things may not get tested. Certainly the mother may not come back. Um, so you can see where with a hearing test or the blood stick and looking for some of these genetic and metabolic disorders, there, there definitely can be a problem of, of follow through. I can't imagine leaving the hospital at 24 hours after childbirth. <laughs> but I guess you do what you have to do and especially if you're afraid. Now you've also heard stories about the child is born and the umbilical cord is wrapped around their neck, and that does happen. 
But before delivery, because of the ultrasound usage, we know if that cord is around the neck. And so the doctor is going to be watching that. Sometimes if the cord is too tight, uh, I've heard parents say, oh, he was purple when he came out. Well, you don't want that. That means there was probably anoxia. We have anoxia and we have hypoxia. The anoxia is without oxygen. That child was without oxygen, no oxygen. Hypoxia is a reduction in the oxygen level that was in the body and going to the brain. Well, for how long? How tight was the cord? Was the, was the cord tightened as the child came through the birth canal? So there are variables that you don't know about. But what you do is you watch milestone development. We don't want to say to a parent, oh, this is bad. He's never going to walk or talk. We don't know that because the variables are too great. If there's hypoxia and or anoxia, there's going to be neurological damage for sure. The damage often results in severe communication disorders, motor, motor disorders, such as a child who's been diagnosed with cerebral palsy, impaired cognition, feeding problems, swallowing problems, and these aren't reversed. These issues are not reversed. Therefore, parents have to be given education about how to stimulate their infant what to look for, call in early intervention to give some emotional support to that family. Family education is always, always, always important and vital because what we do is important, but we can't do it all. We're not with that child 24 seven. We need their help. So the bond that you build with that family is extremely important. They need to trust you they need to have confidence in you. Therefore, how you conduct yourself professionally is important. How you communicate is important. It goes back to the beginning of this semester or of this chapter when I talked about your need to present yourself professionally and put that best foot forward so that they have trust and confidence in you. Okay, that was approximately 27 minutes. I'm going to stop there. When we begin the uh, 9C section, we're going to talk a little bit, overview a little bit about some hearing loss, and I'll start on PowerPoint page 156. I want to wish you a happy Easter. I hope you have a good day with your families. See you later.